All right, good morning everyone and thank you for coming to this early morning session. Uh, we're delighted you're here to discuss uh, a really important issue, the global health diplomacy around the new uh, global health strategy of uh, the European Union. Uh, there's lots of things to discuss around that. Uh, there have just been global health debates at the UN General Assembly, very difficult negotiations there, very um, meager outcomes, uh, I would say, in my personal opinion. And uh, it's really a very critical time for health diplomacy uh, and a very critical time for global health, and uh, this is something we really want to uh, discuss together. We have a group of uh, very uh, distinguished speakers here who uh, have been involved in many of these uh, processes. We have Carolyn Bollas, Senior Advisor from WHO Europe. We have Milka Sokolovic, the General Di Director General of the European Public Health Alliance. We have Isabel de la Mata, who is Principal Advisor for Health and Crisis Management at the European Commission. We have Rupa Dat with us, uh, who is the Executive Director and Co-Funder of Women in Global Health. And we have Jan Willem Schögrond, uh, who uh, is from COCIR, and I don't know anymore what that means. So, so uh, you, will, uh, you will help us uh, take this forward as a representative of uh, the private sector. So uh, we want to discuss this. I know there have been moderators that walk around and all of this, but that is difficult uh, for the uh, people who are trying to film this and for the colleagues who are online. So we've decided we'll just stay and, uh, and sit here. There's some housekeeping uh, that uh, um, Anne-Sophie Travert from the Young Forum Augustinas, uh, she'll be monitoring Slido for comments. So there can be online comments and questions. We only have one hour, so I'm not going to promise you uh, a lot of questions from the floor and things like that. If it's possible, uh, we uh, will do it. Uh, the, on -site or the online audience can go to slido.com and use the keyword globe or scan the QR code on the room, room screens. And uh, obviously the audience here can also use uh, Slido. So I'm going to jump uh, into the discussion straight away. You know that the global health strategy of uh, the uh, European Union is uh, about a year old now. Uh, there have been a whole range of discussions around that, also within the presidencies. And uh, I'm just going to start with Isabel and say, and ask her, you know, the EU Global Health Strategy, and I hope you've all read it, uh, explicitly says that it's part of a geopolitical a uh, strategic move uh, of the European Union. Now, even within that year, geopolitics has been shifting and changing. So, uh, uh, can you share with us a little bit uh, what is the role of the EU in global health right now? How does it position itself, Isabel? Okay, thank you very much and good morning to everybody. So, um, we have been working on global health without giving that name for, for many years. I think that uh, that's forever. What is changing now is that uh, we have uh, a rational objective principle, so we have something that is ex explicit, and that has been already explicit for, for one year. And I think that uh, for the ones of you that have been following, for example, last week with UNGA, is the, the first time that we, uh, we have disembarked there with so many people and with a, a real agenda and participating in, in everything. So now is more, uh, we are more visible and, and we are uh, trying to put our three uh, huge uh, big principles, uh, I mean the uh, better health for the world, the strengthening the health system and uh, working on, on global uh, health threats, um, visible for, for everybody. So. Um, why this is going to work now when it seems that in the past uh, com and comparing with other 
other countries, for example, the, the United States has always have a, a global health diplomacy or a health diplomacy. Why uh, we think that now is going to work? First, uh, because we have uh, clear and focused priorities. The second one, because uh, we have we have a governance, we we have a way of working with the with the member state and, and with the Commission. Uh, then, because we ensure the alignment uh, along the, the priorities that, that we have defined and a health in all policies approach. Uh, and then because we are monitoring what, uh, what we are doing and, and we are focusing also on, on accountability. So, and one of these approaches is to, to reinforce the health diplomacy. And what do understand by health diplomacy? So, um, to, when, when we plan our external policies, also our internal, uh, take, taking into account that health uh, could be a, a support to other policies and that all the other policies, uh, they, they have to, to aim uh, the, the better health of, uh, of the world. I mean, sounds like a very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Coca-Cola, uh, but um, I think that uh, that uh, this is in reality what we want: uh, health in all policies. At the end, it's, it's health in all, in all policies. Um, we uh, have. Uh, um, been preparing for, for this last year. At, at the end, that was only approved in November uh, uh, 2022, so we didn't have much time. But uh, we have started for the implementation really just before the summer. Um, uh, we have uh, been working, of course, with the, with the member state and having the member state support because otherwise it's, it's impossible. And, and we are giving ourselves uh, several, several instruments, several tools to do, to do that. For example, we, are, we, we have just launched a joint action with the member state. Uh, that uh, What is important is that the, this came at their request. So it not, was not a, an imposition of the commission or was not only an idea of the commission, but was uh, uh, some, something that came from some member state and other joined to ensure a, a coordination. Um, we, we are reinforcing uh, also the, the commission coordination because until now it was like um, uh, this ante was taking care of inside the European Union, IMPA was taking care of outside the European Union, NIAR was taking care of uh, something in the middle, so around the European Union. So different, uh, different general directors, different services of the of the Commission was taking care of different things, and now we are we are coordinating, um, and we are engaging with the stakeholders, and I think that this is important through the whole uh, Global Health Policy Forum, uh, that uh, for the implementation and and for the for for the monitoring. I think as a first. Thank you, Isabel, for giving us you know, this uh, rough overview. Those of you that haven't read the strategy, I would really recommend that you do so. There's a lot of uh, governance suggestions also, also how the uh, European Union wants to position itself towards other organizations in terms of its uh, involvement in the World Health Organization. Uh, the uh, strategy has a very strong commitment to the World Health Organization and a very strong commitment to a range of values which includes uh, uh, the uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which leads me to my next question. The last time we had uh, a global health strategy of the European Union, there were council conclusions that supported the strategy. Uh, meanwhile, we're into the second presidency, or the third presidency even, depending how you count it, in relation uh, to the strategy. Why don't we have council conclusions? The council conclusion is something that does not depend of the commission, depends of the of the member state and of the presidency. Uh, when a presidency want to have council conclusion uh, in whatever matters, uh, what is fundamental is to have uh, they, they have to be approved by unanimity. Otherwise, uh, they are called um, presidency conclusion and not council conclusion. And in this uh, area, it seems that. Um, uh, still the member states are discussing and they don't have a united position in one of these uh, horizontal issues that, uh, that is popping up in other files that are not only the, the health files. And it's been difficult, but um, we are, uh, even if it's not the, the, the commission responsibility, we are still working with uh, all, the, all the presidency. We were nearly there uh, last time, but uh, still something, something missing. 
So, I mean, I don't want to enter in additional details. Uh, the ones that are involved, you know what, uh, what is going around. But, uh, but we still have hope that um, I'm not sure will be possible this presidency, maybe next one. But in any case, even if without council conclusion, at the end, the council conclusion, they don't have a, a, any a normative value. They, they have a, like a political value, but it's not a, it's not a regulation. It's a soft, uh, soft legislation. So we can work, and we are working, and we are working with the member state even without council conclusions. Thank you, Isabel. But this shows us in terms of global health diplomacy that you know, we spoke about geopolitics and the European Union, in a sense, you know, the geopolitics towards the rest of the world. But here we have uh, you know, a certain amount of, of conflict uh, within the European Union as to uh, certain ways of approaching global health and the values that relate to global health. And we'll come back uh, to some of these issues. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the uh, strategy uh, is uh, very, very supportive of, uh, of the World uh, Health Organization. Uh, we have Carolyn Bollas here with us. Uh, and uh, we can see also that uh, global health diplomacy is becoming more important and more visible, I would say. It's always been important in WHO, obviously, but it's also becoming much more, more visible. Uh, there's a war going on in, in Europe, and uh, WHO Europe is very active in uh, supporting uh, the uh, health uh, challenges that have emerged in, in Ukraine. So how does WHO manage this conflict of a war in Europe? It's had that before, of course, think of the Yugoslav wars, but now it is a very prominent issue. Thank you, Th thank you Ilona. Well, I just think that, as you mentioned in the introduction, global health has become increasingly complex and challenging. And, and you know, it's not the first crisis, the first conflict WHO is dealing with, WHO is trying to respond. And as you rightly said also, I think our country office is very well equipped, is very well coordinating with more than 150 partners on the ground. But at the same time, what has changed in WHO is that maybe, if I would say, other parts of the organization have woken up and the coordination mechanism is working very well. I believe we all have heard of Dr. Tedros' initiative, uh, Health for Peace. Even it was challenging last year at the assembly. You know, we, we have a Health for Peace initiative and this is really driving the organization in a much better coordinated manner. I think now we deal with um, 80% of where the humanitarian caseload is going for WHO. This is also in these areas of conflict. So the organization has to be equipped. This is why global health diplomacy is becoming a topic inside the organization and outside. We are aware that WHO is technical. It has the mandate to be the you know, the guardian of public health, but we cannot keep walking on one leg. That leg is technical, but we have to also learn to walk with the diplomacy leg, which uh, some colleagues might call it political. Some say, no, diplomacy is not politics. But it is something that, you know, WHO has woken up to. And to use uh, the words of our regional director, it has to be in our DNA. Health diplomacy must sit in the DNA of people working in health. Otherwise, we cannot, you know, continue to deal with the challenges. Thank you, Carolyn. A very, very important development. And of course, uh, there have been uh, initiatives in the past to try and push this health diplomacy thing. Uh, but I think its prominence, its importance, as you say, has uh, really become clear with uh, the geopolitical divides, with the wars going on, etc. You've embarked on a training initiative also uh, in uh, the European office. Who are you training? What do you hope to achieve through that? Yeah, so just to also put it in a broader perspective, we thought a bit in the office of the EU, as you know, Brussels is the capital of diplomacy. Some would say, no, it's Geneva. Some would say, no, it's Washington. But we realized, well, you know, Brussels is a capital where global health agenda is driving. So in WHO, we have launched something which we call a hat. It has four pillars, action for health, engagement, advocacy, and diplomacy. So the fourth pillar is the diplomacy pillar. And as part of that, we have launched this, you know, global health leadership diplomacy dialogue, which kicked off last week. And our focus is to train 
government officials from Ministry of Health, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also WHO representatives. So these are the what we call the DGs or the RDs for WHO at the country level, but also civil society colleagues. So this is really the audience, and we want to do this hand in hand with other diplomacy, you know, uh, initiatives going on. So we are not saying that this is new or this is, you know, everyone should come to Brussels. We are just saying Brussels needs to walk hand in hand with Geneva, with Washington. And this is exactly what also was mentioned in the EU Global Health Strategy. It gave us this, you know, this, um, Ali, this thinking, oh yes, they are right. They are saying there are these three capitals, let's do something. So this is why we, we hope to be um, doing that together with, with other uh, initiatives already ongoing. So, let's see. Thank you very much, and uh, a very interesting element to say, you know, Brussels that wasn't really on the radar of other global health actors, as you said, you know, Geneva, New York, Washington, maybe Beijing. Uh, so, uh, but that is shifting, and we're seeing many more capitals of global health diplomacy also emerging. We've seen a very big role, let's say, of Delhi, of India, around the G20 initiatives with a prominence that has never been there before. So we're having these new uh, sort of capitals of health diplomacy, and it'll also be important, as you indicated, that not everyone sort of works for themselves, but that there is interchange and that there is dialogue. You've already uh, mentioned you mentioned it, uh, Carolyn, that uh, uh, in many cases when people hear the word diplomacy, they think of ambassadors and uh, very stuffy people going around and having cocktails. Uh, but uh, we've started to understand that uh, global health diplomacy is really to a large extent uh, nearly everyone's business in global health. Everyone is confronted with it. The civil society, the private sector, the organizations and the member states. And again, in the past, one would have thought, well, diplomacy is a thing of countries, of nation states. It's not a thing that you know organizations should engage in civil society, anyhow not. But that's not the case anymore. So Milka, if you can share with us how does civil society see global health diplomacy? How do you position yourselves in this complicated context? Thank you, Ilona. Well, you said things are shifting, but the world is shifting also and, and setting them a moving targets to us. Uh, and a, in addition to the palpable global crisis that we all know about, there is also growing poverty. There are complexities of underdevelopment. There, there is unresolved colonial past, and then also the new forms of colonialism. Um, and if we are to deal with these crises uh, and seize the opportunities, we really need to look into partnerships and also um, create partnerships with the civil society. And uh, Isabel has mentioned the three global, uh, EU global health uh, uh, priorities, and there are also the 20 principles of the, of the EU global health strategy that we should be all aware of by now. But I think the one number 17, which is to expand partnerships on equal footing mm -hmm. uh, based on mutual interest is the key one uh, uh, for, uh, for success. Um, but then the challenge is to understand the civil society at any given place uh, and its relationship with health and its potential to further improve health and let alone in, in health diplomacy. Uh, and that's due to the immense diversity of civil society across sectors, within sectors. And if you want only within the health sector, you have civil society representing patients, representing health professionals, vulnerable population groups, researchers, a plethora of, uh, of uh, diversity. Uh, and also, only within the European region, the civil society is uh, very specific to the political milieu of any, any given country, to culture, uh, and it's a reflection of tradition and uh, of government and the society per se. And I would dare to say the more um, successful, confident governments 
can afford to have more critical civil society. But I would like to highlight really the essential role of, uh, of civil society in defending democracy and in defending the rule of law and in providing expertise. And that is what we kind of keep forgetting. You know that like there is health diplomacy and global health diplomacy that is related to the states and also to the, to the um, markets, but if we are to help people, we need to talk to people. If we are to, uh, we need to understand the needs of people. We need to understand, like if we, if we have a patient, we need to understand what hurts. And, that is, and the only way to understand what hurts is to, to talk to them. Uh, so for me, um, the global health diplomacy is meant to say, solve a knot of interconnected, very wicked problems. Um, but that cannot be done without thinking out of the boxes that are set by the state and the market, because these boxes have brought us where we are now. So I would say that, that civil society organizations can say and do what the state and the market cannot. So that is the niche for the civil society to, to operate in these, uh, in these circumstances. Thank you, Milka. Even though, you know, there is now partly uh, an even more complex situation. You say, you know, there, are, there is that part of civil society that advocates for health, uh, that is, you know, part of uh, trying to move the global health agenda forward, etc. But we have seen increasing polarization also with a new type of civil society emerging uh, around uh, uh, issues uh, like anti-vaccination, etc., that, you know, will have a, has had and will continue to have a, a significant impact. And that polarization is also an issue that uh, one will have to address uh, in uh, global health diplomacy. And that uh, is creating difficulties also for civil society because some of these groups uh, claim to be part of the civil society and have significant funding, often from sources that we are not aware of. Uh, but the issue I also wanted to come back to you about, uh, Milka, is many people say there is a shrinking space for civil society, and particularly in the negotiation now of the so-called pandemic accords, there have been many calls for more transparency, for more involvement of civil society in the negotiations. Can you say a bit about those challenges? I can. Um but let me first address the question of not so civil civil society. There is really a, a, a risk and challenge in engaging civil society, and I think we need to be at the edges of our seats and always very conscious of the background of the organizations that we are reaching out to and engaging. They are not always credible, they are not always evidence-based, they are not necessarily always uh, working with public interest in mind. Some of them are in service of sometimes undisclosed uh, vested interests, so I, I very much uh, uh, support your, your notion there. Also, civil society can <laughs> bridge or reinforce social divides, so we really need to be, need to be careful there. Um, we have also seen civil society movements prior to the Second World War that was not so civil. It was strong and, and powerful, but not so civil um, uh, in their intentions. So with that kind of reservation in mind, I would still like to say that it is critically important to engage civil society, but indeed the, the space for civil society is increasingly shrinking. And I would say that has to do with the rise of the, of the right uh, right-wing political uh, powers, um, and across the world, the civil society is confronted with, uh, with increased barriers. The, the meaningful dialogue is in decline, the, the activities are restricted, the civil society faces attacks, um, and they're actively preventing prevented from, from taking their actions and carrying out their roles. And we have observed such trends in Europe, especially in the uh, Eastern European countries. Uh, the right to information is being denied. Um, the public consultations are lacking. The access to public funding is missing, sometimes absent completely. Um, so that's, that I see as a, as a real challenge. 
Uh, and in the EU, we see uh, especially disadvantaged position of health civil society because uh, compared to other civil society sectors, we are at the moment deprived from uh, sustainable long-term structural funding, unlike the, unlike the others, as I said. Uh, and also there is a little bit of tokenism and box ticking, not a little bit. But there are examples of meaningful engagement with civil society. Caroline has mentioned it, and I would really like to highlight that. And that is what, what the WHO Euro is doing with civil society, but also the headquarters. And I would really like to, to make a point that with such with such, with such an example, we hope that the context can be, can be changed and, and um, improved for engaging civil society. So just as, as an example, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, there are examples and uh, some of you might know that uh, Dr. Tedros has established, I think it's called a commission? Uh, just wanted for to say civil, civil society, society so uh, we might be able to, to come back to that. But Rupa, you also work in this you know, civil society context. You've just come back from the UN General Assembly. Uh, one of the things we have noticed in global health and global health diplomacy that uh, many agreements actually are not signed. Countries do not come together because they no longer agree on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that, of course, is a key factor of the work also of women in global health that you have founded. So uh, could you share with us also some of your experiences here, maybe uh, some experiences also from New York uh, last week? What is happening here? I mean, we've seen that you know, negotiations on universal health coverage have broken down because of this. What's happening? Why is this happening? What can global health diplomacy do? Well, uh, thank you, Alona. And um, yes, last week um, was a big disappointment um, for those of you that are following the yeah, United Nations General Assembly uh, negotiations. There were three high-level meetings on health, uh, particularly the ones that Women in Global Health was paying close attention to was uh, the high-level meeting on pandemic preparedness and response, the very first time that was taking place, um, as well as universal health coverage. Um, both meetings had political declarations that were being negotiated. Usually these political declarations uh, get finalized in July, uh, but last week um, civil society as well as member states' governments were holding their breath, uh, not knowing whether the political declaration would pass, and it was at the opening of each of these high-level meetings that the political declarations passed um, because of the, the, the president um, of, of the assembly. So that just shows you an example of diplomacy um, really failing. Even though some applaud that these declarations have passed, we know it sends a strong message um, that in multilateralism, consensus was unable to be reached, um, and as well as the language in these documents um, when it comes to equity, rights, accountability. These are the type of criticisms. Uh, but I'm going to particularly focus on um, some of the areas that Women in Global Health has been following on this. Um, in these political declarations, we uh, were able to uh, see some progress on language when it comes um, to gender equality related to women in the health workforce. Uh, so acknowledging that women are health workers, uh, that there are gender equity dimensions, including addressing issues on pay, as well as uh, acknowledging the role of women's leadership. So we um, acknowledge there is some progress, but at the same time, and this is how, you know, going back, that it, it is uh, quite complicated when we look at the advancement of women's rights is uh, the uh, universal health coverage declaration was weaker than the 2019 one. Uh, Women in Global Health, with many other civil society organizations, launched an alliance called uh, the Alliance for Gender Equality and Universal Health Coverage, which has over 200 um, organizations uh, from around the world, 70 different countries. And collectively, we've kept that alliance active since 2019 to make sure that gender equality, which includes a strong pillar of women's rights, um, um, and women's um, rights, uh, including their access to sexual reproductive health, um, is uh, part of it and integral. So we were able to use that alliance in 2019 to get the language in. But guess what? This past political declaration, it's not there. 
again, I'm going to say it's not there. So we are seeing an active um, uh, a, a roll, rollback, even though civil society is showing up in big numbers. The alliance never stopped. The alliance is active um, in capitals, um, and it's active in those uh, cities that were named um, earlier as areas um, of importance. Um, I'm going to also share another um, data point that one of our chapter members um, from Women in Global Finland did. Is, um, they looked at... Uh, by, uh, universal agreements from 2015 um, to uh, to 2020, and they have seen that there's actually been um, a repeal of women's rights languages. Um, and just to put it more concretely, as we are at a health forum, what are the examples of women's rights um, health uh, that we are seeing? For example, in many countries, it's becoming illegal to even get access to safe abortion for issues that are life-threatening um, to women. So if some, if, uh, if, if if a woman is pregnant and she has a septic, um, which is an infectious, um, you know, presentation um, while while um, being um, a carrier, uh, she's not able to access safe abortion. Similarly, contraception is being limited, and many of these um, rights um, were agreed upon in declarations, even dating back to um, the International Conference on uh, Population Development, Cairo, 1994. Uh, so to see that, you know, we're, we are in a, in a time period where agreements from, uh, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, I also want to say one other point on this, um, Alona, is that um, we're finding it controversial to even um, see the word women um, uh, stay in, in these declarations. And so I think it's really important to uh, recognize that um, we are seeing uh, this, this rollback, this pushback. It's real. Even using the word women itself is controversial. Um, and so when we call ourselves women in global health, we are standing with our core mission on advancing gender equality and women's rights. Thank you very much, Rupa. And uh, you can see, some of you know, that Women in Global Health Austria uh, was launched uh, yesterday, how important this is. And, uh, of course, uh, we also know that uh, this is uh, an issue uh, of, uh, from countries all around the world, that uh, some of the neighboring countries of Austria are some of those countries that are actively uh, arguing against uh, women's rights. I wanted to ask you something else though, Rupa, because it might have an influence on this. You look at this panel and you would think, you know, global health diplomacy is quite female. Uh, but uh, from what you have uh, studied in women in global health of, you know, the World Health Assembly, etc., that's not the case. Would you share with us a little bit about the male-female power in global health diplomacy? Uh, yes, thank, thank, thank you, Alona. So, uh, if every room looked like this room, right? That's that's what we should say, and 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 with more diversity. So, um, giving you a snapshot of how women's uh, representation, especially in diplomacy, looks like. Women in global health um, since 2015 has been tracking numbers, and not just tracking numbers from 2015. We uh, track numbers all the way back to the very first World Health Assembly that took place, um, and counted every delegation, which which was a very interesting historical uh, analysis. And in that, we found um, that progress in representation of women at the highest levels of um, global health uh, policy making, if we say that is uh, the World Health Assembly, um, has been stagnant. It it's, uh, stands at about 25% of the representation of the head of a delegation has been a woman. But I also want to um, put this in context. When you take a look at the global health workforce, 70% of those health workforce roles are women. But if you look at even um, the rates that women are graduating, whether it's from public health schools, global health programs, medical schools, uh, nursing, name it, any, any sector in the health, those numbers are easily 50%, if not more. So that discrepancy is a real one. It's not grounded in the fact that women um, need to be just trained. It's actually th the factors. Uh, but looking at it from a political aspect of it, as we've seen, um, and rightly so, global health rise to 
to uh, uh, more significance as head of state started paying attention. We were looking specifically at what was happening to women's representation during the pandemic. And those numbers uh, quickly dwindled, even within the first um, few months when there was a realization that um, COVID-19 was not going to be a matter of a few weeks, but it was entering to something to be a few months. I think nobody imagined years, um, but this um, changed the representation of women. I'll give you a few numbers, and, and I'll come back to you, Alona. Um, one number is that when we looked at COVID-19 task teams all around the world, 114 um, we mapped out, we found that only 5% had gender parity in the COVID-19 task teams. 85% of them were majority men. Um, even so, there were task teams around the world that had um, 10 members, 20 members, and they were all men, including the city that I was in at, Washington, D.C., the first um, COVID-19 task team, there was all men, 20, 20 men. Um, the second number I want to point out is that we were tracking the WHO Executive Board, which is a very powerful um, appointment uh, by governments to uh, which uh, member states' governments on who will uh, hold that seat of power. Last year, the WHO Executive Board, again, this is government's representation, dropped down to six percent. So women only had six percent representation and one could say that that was, you know, the peak. Um, and then when we look at the pandemic um, accord negotiations and uh, government appointees for the co-chairs, one out of six are women. So this is, this is an example. This stage does not represent what's happening. And we know that when women and um, uh, diverse women and, and just people from different backgrounds are not included in the design process, our solutions are, are not going to be as diverse. They're not going to be as sustainable. So this impacts uh, overall, um, you know, the, the ultimate goal, which we're trying to achieve is health equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupa, and thank you for those data. And uh, of course, one must see that, uh, and uh, I know that uh, Dr. Tedros in WHO has been trying to give a message to his member states, if I can call them that. But you've uh, mentioned the result. And uh, so you're now also having a, a kind of tension between trying very hard to appoint senior level women in the organization and often also not getting enough suggestions from member states as to women experts for those positions and then the kind of political representation uh, that uh, really influences global health diplomacy, what is negotiated, how it is negotiated, what the priority issues are. And uh, I think uh, we must keep a clear eye on that and it also shows when you're doing when you're thinking about global health diplomacy what you have to analyze what kind of data you have to look for and uh, how you can make the point let's go to our, our last uh, sorry uh, you've had a lot of talking time and we hope to get back to some of it Rupa um, we uh, we'll go back uh, uh, we'll go to Jan Wilhelm now uh, to uh, discuss another very very contentious uh, area of global health diplomacy, particularly if we look at the negotiations around uh, the pandemic treaty, uh, the pandemic accord in Geneva, uh, the north-south debate around access to technology, the issues around intellectual property. A key contention in global health diplomacy is also should intellectual property be discussed in the World Health Organization or at the World Trade Organization. There's a whole heap of issues around that and, of course, a major north-south conflict. So, Jan Wilhelm, uh, how does uh, the private sector deal with that? Uh, what's your global health diplomacy from the private sector? It used to be called lobbying, but uh, I guess it's changing as well. Yeah, we don't lobby anymore. We do uh, diplomacy nowadays. <laughs> um, and, and let me also say that I fully agree with everything you said, uh, Rupa, about uh, women, women in leadership and in healthcare. And I'll get back to that later on why that's so important, and especially now. So the private sector has, has mainly been seen as an, a sector that has to be managed in terms of risk. Uh, especially pre-pandemic, it was okay, the private sector was doing a thing, but it was a risk and it needed to be regulated, and then everything would be fine. But then, of course, during COVID, uh, suddenly, you know, governments turned to the private sector in a big way all over the world, trying to say, okay, can we actually, 
get your help innovate faster. We don't know this disease. We need new diagnostics. We need new treatment methodologies. We need, you know, everything new. Um, and so we were actually very intensively working together with governments all over the world, in particular also the WHO, because one of the biggest challenges in diplomacy was who gets what medicine first. So the international solidarity, which we've discussed this morning, is lacking, was very predominantly, very obviously lacking during the crisis. It was me first, right? So we've had discussions with many governments and said, you know, my people need this first and I'll pay most. And it was actually the private sector that said, well, that's not how we work, that's not, that's not fair. So we actually turned to the WHO, can you please introduce some solidarity principles so that we go on a needs basis rather than on a you know, greed basis? Um, and, and so the, the, the narrative, the dialogue between the private sector and the governments changed. The EU played a very important role in that, um, in, in facilitating that discussion, WHO also. But there were weaknesses and gaps because even EU member states were there to say, can we go first or at least second? Um, after COVID, you know, the, the discussion about how do we engage with the private sector, not only from a risk management point of view, but also as an opportunity for addressing some of our societal challenges, came into kind of a, a stalemate because we were still dealing with the aftermath of COVID and propaganda and populism and localization, protectionism. You know, everybody thought that during COVID, the supply chains didn't work. Well, actually the supply chains worked. Yeah, but the whole idea to localize everything uh, stems from the idea that everybody can be autonomous. Well, th there's no autonomy in this world anymore. I mean, going, you can create a new balance, but there's no strategic autonomy uh, in, the in the sense of owning your own supply chains. Um, so now we're, we're moving to a phase after COVID that we think we need to work on a different level uh, with the private sector. In fact, the private sector is needed. It was called out last week at the UNGA where I was as well on those three summits. There was a big focus on private sector, innovation, digitization, the role of AI. These developments are going so fast and they have the opportunity to really make advances. They also have the risk of really getting us off track. So it's really important that we continue to dialogue very intensively, very closely to make sure that we, you know, we drive these innovations, we drive this development of the private sector in the right direction. We need that as well. Uh, so COSIR is the, the, the trade association for imaging, radio uh, radiotherapy and for digitization. Digitization is, is, everybody holds this as a promise, but it's only gonna be a promise on delivering equality, you know, fair access, uh, affordability, uh, unbiased treatment, if we manage that together. Um, otherwise, we would be, you know, to, to Milka's point, subjected to the civil societies who have maybe ulterior motives uh, than improving the state of the world. Jan Wilhelm, thank you for that. And maybe if I can take it back now to uh, also the European Global Health Strategy and you know the role of Brussels, et cetera, and uh, the uh, famous Brussels effect as well uh, in terms of regulations that Europe takes that then influence the rest of the world. But if we look at the you know competition in technology, in digital, in AI, if we look at the way Washington is handling it in relation to Beijing, uh, which is basically you know let's stop every cooperation. Uh, then um, wh how, how can Europe play a role here? And I'm asking because this technology, you've indicated it, the digital world is becoming ever more important for global health. And if we don't find a way of cooperating in this very critical area, it is uh, going to be very dangerous for uh, global health in terms of, you've indicated, access to knowledge, sharing, uh, medicines, uh, whatever. How, how does that uh, play out in your world already, these new geopolitical uh, positionings? Yeah, so I'm, I'm here for Coast here, but in my daily life I work for Philips as well, and of course AI is super important to us. So I was in China a few weeks ago, and to Caroline's point, uh, the, the geopolitical battle between the United States and China is being fought out in the EU. The EU is the battleground for all tensions. And, and so we need to understand that that's happening at the moment. But I also believe that healthcare can be really uh, used for diplomacy. So if you look at the Chinese government, they, they are very interested in growing in their healthcare, but they're also very interested in the foreign direct investment. And so we had a collaboration between the Netherlands and China about green hospital development 
one of those societal challenges where the private sector can play a role. How do we mitigate climate change and how do we make healthcare carbon neutral? They have 37,000 hospitals in China and are very excited about working together with Europe on decarbonizing healthcare. Despite all the, the discussion about COP28, China wants this. And so they feel that that's a way to actually improve and ease the tensions, um, uh, to actually uh, improve the relationship with the EU and maybe other stakeholders through healthcare, through better healthcare, through climate neutral healthcare. Um, and that can also, if that works, then we can maybe even start to collaborate on AI. Imagine if we could actually access Chinese data and European data to introduce better AI. And why is that so important? AI holds a massive promise to decarbonize healthcare. But AI without Chinese data is going to be biased. AI without women data is going to be biased. AI without Global South data is going to be biased and therefore not credible and people will not have confidence in it because they feel left behind. So you start on an area which is relatively safe. You know, everybody wants to decarbonize the healthcare sector. China wants that, Europe wants that, the United States wants that as well. And I think that opens the channel to actually build trust, which is the key role of diplomacy, and then expand to other areas gradually where we need to work together. And we need to work together on the societal, big societal challenges where the private sector also is committed. That brings me to the sexual reproductive health and rights. You know, uh, I was there last week at the high level commission on the ICPD 25, the Cairo uh, follow up on sexual reproductive health and rights. And I said, look, the private sector is actually, it's not only there for birth control uh, and antenatal care, but actually we have a role to play in introducing gender equality in our management, in making sure that our AI is gender equal and, and, and diverse. And so we are actually practicing some of the things, but Governments can call upon us if they can't call upon each other. Yeah, because governments are stuck with each other in global partnership that they can't somehow break. But the biggest employer in the world is the private sector. So call upon us to address maybe some of the healthcare challenges that maybe we weren't ready or we weren't thinking about solving, but we actually have the opportunity to do. So we, I, I believe thoroughly that whether it's the geopolitical conflict between China, United States and Europe, or whether it's some of the societal challenges like gender equality or climate change, that we can call, be called upon in a different dialogue to help step up to the plate and address some of the challenges together. Thank you, Jan Wilhelm, and I'd like to turn to Isabel because, you know, the global health strategy does make reference to some of these things, sometimes more clearly, sometimes more vaguely. But, uh, you know, you heard the battle is being fought in Brussels. Uh, so, uh, what role does uh, the uh, European Union and then specifically the Commission with its work play in terms of this access, in terms of if, you know, the strategy is geopolitical, um, how can it act? Um, well, uh, we are like the, the middlemen uh, between the member states and, and trying to negotiate with international organizations. So I think that we have reinforced our role in, the, in all the, these events. Uh, we didn't attend the UNGA before, or there was someone from the delegation, and uh, is that uh, our role with WHO uh, has been uh, evolving uh, over the years to combat them, uh, to ignore them, and now to work with the, with the WHO more, more and more. So um, what uh, when when and, and we are having a, a voice uh, more more frequently and, and really now in the international organizations. Another thing is that uh, we are joining forces with uh, with WHO, for example. And we are also enhancing the, the financial contribution to, to WHO being regular or uh, ad hoc for, for different issues. And, and uh, even when, when we put in place the EU for Health program uh, from the beginning, that was clear that our relation with WHO will be different and that we pass to uh, this financing on 100%. But now we have reinforced that we are having uh, contribution agreements with, the, with WHO for the 
the issues that are of, uh, of mutual interest and, and always working uh, yes, with, the, with the member state and trying to do also with the, with the other stakeholders. So uh, I think that we are positioning as uh, outside Brussels, uh, so making us uh, visible in, uh, yeah, in the world and uh, in, in New York and we will participate in the regional committee. We have been participating, uh, I mean, uh, almost forever, but now uh, uh, upgrading the, the level of, uh, of this participation and, and also being uh, more involved. So going hand, hand to hand to with, uh, with, the, with the WHO, but not only, I, I mean, also with the other international organizations that are, are working uh, more or less in health, could be UNICEF, could be IOM, could be the Red Cross, could be uh, whoever. So uh, we are trying always to, to upgrade our participation and, and be not, not leading, but uh, uh, the member states, because uh, we have uh, these uh, preparatory meetings for, for everything and um, for all the international meetings. And one of the things that we are doing is what we call the burden sharing. So it's not the commission who is doing everything. We decide, we distribute uh, or we, we volunteer among the, the member state and, and also the commission who is doing to do what, who is going to lead in this um, workforce resolution, who is going to lead in the universal health coverage, who is going to lead. So uh, in that way that that, uh, that is being seen not, not as commission, but as EU uh, work. Thank you. And uh, I think what you've also indicated is that global health diplomacy is becoming more complex. On the one hand, uh, many more actors, but also you need to be represented in many more places. You need to talk to many more people. I mean, talking uh, to uh, health negotiators from uh, ministries uh, this year, you know, they were exhausted. They were preparing three UNGA meetings. They were constantly traveling to India because India decided to have at least three to four special health meetings. They had the World Health Assembly. They had meetings in Brussels. They had meetings in Copenhagen. They were negotiating a treaty. So, you know, also for us who've always been pushing, uh, let's put health on the agenda, um, uh, we have to ask ourselves, is it good to be on so many agendas at the same time? Because then it possibly, you know, lacks depth, but also it opens opportunities for what is called, you know, uh, a sort of um, the forum shifting. You don't get what you want here, you try it there because you're in a different constellation. So it's gotten significantly more complex in those terms. But I believe, and Carolyn, I'd like to ask you there, it's become more complex also in terms of the issues. If I think of WHO, uh, 15 years ago, I think parts of WHO got rid of its research uh, uh, council and things like that. And now innovation, supply chains, technology, digitalization are in the center also of global health diplomacy. Is WHO ready for that? Of course, uh, you ask me, and you know, my, my legitimacy of sitting here is, is working, I believe, in WHO, so maybe my response is a bit biased. <laughs> but uh, I should say, I've seen the work at the country office. I worked in a country office, in a regional office, and in headquarters. And I've also seen the changes that you talked about. When I started, also, I think, 15 years ago, WHO was very different. But since I left Geneva two years ago, they were just setting up an innovation hub, like I think Jan Willem has the one in Eindhoven. Well, we now have one in Geneva, and I invite you to, you know, and I was talking to the new director of uh, digital and innovation saying, wow, you're making an innovation hub in the WHO cafeteria. Like, you know, it's <laughs> like, yes, the world has changed. So to say, I think, of course, it is still challenging and you're very right, it's complex. It's not that, you know, and we need to go beyond our silos of working. I'm working on, you know, NCDs, this person is working on 
I don't know, whatever topic. It doesn't work like that anymore because things are interconnected and we need to move around that nexus. But I do believe that with the, you know, with the leadership that Dr. Tedros has brought in and also Hans, uh, Dr. Hans Kluge, the regional director and also the other regional directors, this shift is also, you know, inspiring people uh, in the organization to stand up and to be a true health diplomat. Thank you. And Sophie, are there interesting comments that you've had from the web, just to hear two or three of them? So we see four main themes emerging from the comments so far. So the first one being on EU global health strategy implementation. So uh, what alternatives are there? to those council conclusions uh, in terms of pushing and calling for concrete actions? And then are there any lessons learned from the concrete actions that have been implemented so far? So there was a specific question mentioning, for example, the Team Europe Initiatives tool and how this has influenced maybe uh, EU health diplomacy. Um, and uh, questions around uh, areas of cooperation between the WHO and the EU, if you could mention some specific ones. Then the second theme that is emerging is around global health governance. So how can we strengthen the voice of global South, uh, of the global South in uh, the global health governance? Um, and do you believe that uh, we can do health diplomacy only with soft tools um, and how to ensure that pandemic treaty negotiations reach um, you know, an agreement before the next uh, crisis. Uh, there was also regarding governance a question regarding the role of the private foundations um, and non-elected uh, bodies uh, in global health diplomacy. Then we have a third theme on health diplomacy advocacy uh, and if there are any formal or institutional channels to guarantee the involvement of civil society. Uh, in health advocacy. And then finally, a fourth theme around uh, the involvement of regions, so the regional uh, level. Uh, what is the role of regions or even regional organizations, also thinking of our African counterparts, for example, and the rise of uh, new institutions? Thank you. Thank you, Anne Sophie, and obviously we can't answer all of them, but I thought it was important to hear you know, what the community is thinking about, what they would like to hear more about, and also it's, uh, it's a signal to the European Health Forum Gastein, the kind of issues it could be taking up and discussing also in workshops and working groups as we move forward during the year, and of course at uh, each of the... Um, each of the meetings here in Gastein. I'd like to end with our title, Health Diplomacy at a Crossroads. So um, I'd like each of you, and we just have enough time to uh, give a, a very short and, and pointed view uh, on this notion of the crossroads. And uh, where do you think uh, we need to be moving as a next step? So, Mirka, do you want to start? Very short, very precise. Crossroads, yes or no, and where to? Well, crossroads, definitely. Where to? Towards increased per own personal responsibility. So, when it comes to the civil society, yes, there is responsibility of other actors to engage civil society, but there is also responsibility of the civil society to get more engaged, more ambitiously, uh, and more kind of looking forward and ahead. So, I would put uh, responsibility as a sign of the, of the crossroads. Thank you, Mirka. And that came up in relation to the UN General Assembly and this issue that I've said, you know, health being discussed perhaps too much everywhere. I've used, you know, the film title, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, and maybe to be self-critical in the sense, do we really want this? Where do we want to focus? What's the really important negotiations and uh, how do we move uh, forward? Rupa, what's your point? Uh, keeping it short and simple, uh, definitely health is at crossroads, especially when it comes to gender equality, women's rights and health. Don't be gender, uh, gender neutral is gender blind and that's harmful. So calling on all of you um, to keep that on the agenda. Jan Wilhelm. Um, I believe in the coalition of the willings. So I, I think we're at the crossroad, but all of us will be going off in a different direction. Uh, and ultimately we will convene somewhere on the horizon. Uh, I think we need to allow for the divergence and different coalitions to be shaped around purpose, you know, Im impactful areas where we, where we find the ones that are willing to move faster in a particular direction, like on AI, like on climate, like on gender. And somewhere they will converge, but I think now we're in a stalemate and we're not moving fast enough, so we need to split up. Isabel. 
Um, when we are in a crossroad, we can always choose the, the right way or the, or the wrong way. But uh, at this moment, and the pandemic has bring us this unique opportunity of putting health in the international agenda. There has been other moments in the, in the, in the history, but, but now is a unique moment. So we need to, to continue, not, uh, not let that uh, go. And, uh, and, uh, and this uh, movement that has be begun to make uh, know the importance of health in, in, in all the areas of the world. So uh, that uh, health is in impacting economy, transport, uh, education, everything, and that everything is impacting the, the health. This movement that has been a political movement and never uh, in the past uh, was so huge uh, number of events in, in New York and in other parts, we need to take that and continue to push and to push for the, in our case, for the three big uh, principles of the, of the strategy. Thank you. And WHO last? Yes, well, and uh, I want to make a reference to a great, I would say, Belgium uh, global health diplomat. And I think the title of his book says it all. We have no time to lose. Peter Piot. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, before we end, I'd just like to ask you, how many have read the European Union Global Health Strategy? Well, not enough, but a reasonable number. So I hope that uh, those of you that haven't read it uh, will go and read it and try and relate it to your own work and to the work of your organizations and uh, see how you can help take it forward and implement it and where you maybe don't like it or where you see gaps uh, to discuss that, to bring it into the discussions in Brussels, uh, particularly also through a number of the global health initiatives, but you mentioned the forum also uh, in Brussels, the global health forum. So there is ways and means and the action plans that are developing. So please also within your own countries uh, advocate uh, for this strategy, for participating in the action plans, for moving it forward. And remember, there's an election coming uh, in Europe. And uh, reach out uh, to those people who want to be elected to the European Parliament. Uh, show them the importance of uh, global health, discuss it with them, uh, make them aware of the global health strategy and the positions that uh, they might be taking forward. So be proactive. Uh, I hope uh, this panel gave you some ideas about that. Uh, the global health strategy of the European uh, Union is not something that's you know, somewhere in the commission. Uh, and uh, that the responsibility is only with them to implement it. It's an opportunity for all of us. And I think all Europeans must take it seriously and must take the values in that strategy seriously and the change of perspective. We've mentioned, you know, Global North, Global South uh, uh, a little bit in our discussions, but this strategy explicitly says this has to be built on a partnership. No longer can we uh, dominate in the way we've done in the past. You've mentioned the decolonization movements. It will be very difficult for Europe in some cases to reestablish the trust it lost uh, during uh, the pandemic. And many of you are aware of that around vaccine nationalism, Europeanism, or whatever you want to call it. So we've got a big task in front of us as Europeans. And that's why I think it's so important that the European Health Forum, Gastein, also discusses global health, uh, because we have to be aware of that. And that global health is part of any strategy for a European health union. Thank you very much for coming this morning, and I hope you'll take it forward.